He is risen. Three small words that brought the collective pace of humanity to an absolute standstill. He is risen. Three words that shattered prisons. Words that shook the earth's foundations. Words that transformed a sense of utter despair into cries of pure joy and ecstasy. Echoes of history's greatest triumph that still shape our reality. Even today, we're assaulted by constant distraction, countless sources waging war for our attention, yet three words pierce the noise. In our hunger for validation, our desperate pleas for love and attention, three words calm our anxiety. In a universe spinning at breakneck speed, its inhabitants locked in an existential crisis, three words proclaim the purpose of our existence. He is risen. Lay hold of this truth and embrace the peace within. Yesterday, fear reigned in our hearts. Yesterday, we sat in crippling darkness. Yesterday, we suffered abuse and all the accusations of a broken world. But today, our king, our healer, our defender is risen. And this reality doesn't merely accompany us on a meaningless journey. This changes everything. For you see, if he is risen, then all other pursuits become secondary. All of our failures become insignificant. All criticisms and condemnations become irrelevant. There is only his word, his mission, and his infinite, unconditional love for you. Because he is risen, we look to tomorrow. Tomorrow, we will stop defining our worth through status and social media. Tomorrow, we will together build an everlasting kingdom. Tomorrow and every day after, we will dance in the radiance of a redeeming savior who crushed death and set us free. There is nothing that Jesus cannot overcome. We know this because he lives. We know this because he is risen. What a great video. And regardless of what you're going through, I want you to know today, regardless of what you're going through, I'm going to talk about three boxes today. Uh, it's a little different Easter message. If you want a traditional one, you can listen to the sunrise service. Uh, but uh, um, whatever you're going through, God can meet you right where you are. Now, I think it's funny, Randy. I don't know if you noticed. So Facebook decided. So it gives you the emoticons. You can put happy face, sad face, smiley face, thumbs up. Um, but now it's giving you a few extra choices. So it's got prayer hands, which is pretty good, like praying. And then at the bottom, it also has this. What does that mean? This is clapping? Why isn't this clapping? Okay, this is clapping. I guess that's prayer, so clapping. And then uh, there's a heart, and then amen, which is pretty normal, but then hallelujah, which I don't know that I've ever heard anybody in our church yell the word hallelujah, but it could happen. So um, they have that there. It may change to goofball. Uh, the hallelujah might change after a while. But anyway, uh, while you're watching, you can thumbs up, you can give a heart, you can do all those things. I noticed Dave's joke got a few hearts and laughter. Um, just just a few though, Dave, just so you know. Don't, don't be proud of that joke. So let me tell you what Easter tells us about God. And we're going to be looking at several passages. We'll start in John chapter 12. When I was about, uh, my mom says I was about three years old, I went to Burger King and I asked my dad for a Whopper. And this is back in the old days where the Whopper had the huge box. I mean, it wasn't wrapped. It was a box. And the box was huge. And the box said, home of the Whopper. And it said, Whopper on it. And it said, I'm loving it. No, that was the other place. Uh, it said all kind of stuff on it. It was a cool box. And my dad said, what do you want? Do you want a kid's meal? You know? And I said, no, I want a Whopper. And my dad said, no, no, no. You're not big enough to eat a Whopper. And I said, no, I want a Whopper. So what my dad did is he went up to the counter 
And when, I, when he came to me, I was so excited. I sat at the counter. There was a counter in Miami on US-1. This was one of the first Burger Kings, maybe the first one. It was in Miami, not far from University of Miami. Overlooking US-1, there was the counter and the little seats that you could spin in. Do you remember those? And they had all the colors. And you could spin in them. And uh, I sat in that seat. And all of a sudden, my dad came with the tray. And in front of me, he put that Whopper box. I was so excited. And I opened the Whopper box, and I was so disappointed. This it was so much disappointment that to this day I remember this, and this is still one of my mom's favorite stories to tell, because I opened that Whopper box. And those of you who did not grow up in the uh, uh, early 70s and 80s will not recognize what I'm about to say, but Google it, and then you can find out. But I opened the Whopper box... And I looked distraught. And I looked at my father. And I said, no respect. I get no respect at all. To which my father thought was the most hilarious thing he had ever heard. And he began laughing and went and told my mom that I said that. Now, here's the thing. We're going to look at three boxes today and ways that we look at life. And here's the first one I want to know what Easter tells about God. Number one, he, God brings good. He brings good from bad. He brings good from bad. In John 12, 23 to 26, Jesus was trying to give the disciples a hint at what was coming. And he said this, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So Jesus is looking at the disciples and he tells them, this is what I'm getting ready to do. And of course, we know on Easter morning, they had no idea. They were still clueless. They're looking for his body. They, they don't realize during the Lord's Supper when he's telling them, this is a, a now something totally different. They're arguing with each other on who, they're the Muhammad Ali's of disciples. Who is the greatest and who's going to be on your right hand? And I, I'm the greatest disciple. The truth is, in life so often, when bad things happen, we have ways of coping with it. When bad things happen, some of us are struggling even now with some bad things. When bad things happen, we try to medicate. One of my favorite medications, by the way. We try to medicate in life. Some, sometimes we might, we might go out of our way to even, even sit and, and watch a movie and, and try to get away from the bad things in our life. Just try to hide and maybe put on E.T. Oh. By the way, this is a DVD for those of you who haven't seen one of these. I actually looked for a VCR tape, but I think I've gotten smart enough to put them in the attic. Just don't tell my wife. Um, and then my favorite, Jelly Bellies. You'll notice I actually opened these on the way here. I love Jelly Bellies and the ones that taste like popcorn are the best. Now, for those of us that struggle in life sometimes, sometimes when we're struggling through difficult moments, the way that we try to hide is we try to put what we want in the box. And what we put in the box are things to try to keep us distracted from the hurt and from the pain. Jesus over and over told his disciples, this is what I'm getting ready to do, but they wouldn't listen to him. Why? Because what he was saying was super painful. I can't imagine what went on with the disciples on that Saturday. The Bible doesn't really talk about Saturday, but Saturday's the waiting. It's the time the disciples, you know, we talk about the disciples being afraid, but they were also grieving. Did you know that psychologists say that a lot of people right now are grieving they're grieving loss of life, of course, but they're also grieving lifestyle and things that have happened. There are seniors who will not walk in a graduation anytime soon. Maybe they'll do one later, but it's just not the same. And so they grieve over no prom. They grieve over their life. Some of you have lost your jobs and you're grieving. And if you're not careful, you'll try to fill that grieving with a medication, whatever that may be for you. In Romans 8.28, it says this. 
And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. God's going to work it for good. And so my dad, the reason I was so disappointed with that Whopper box is because when I opened it, there was no Whopper in there. He put a kid's hamburger in my Whopper box, and I wanted a Whopper. Now, if he had put a Whopper in there, I would have said, this is awesome. What a great day. And of course, all of you know, I would have taken four or five bites of the Whopper, and that would have been all I could eat. Maybe worse, I would have tried to eat the whole thing, and you know what would have happened then. Here's the thing. So often we're wanting God to make every single thing good that we try to hide when anything's not good. Listen, embrace the times when things aren't good. Take care of that. And when you notice you are grieving, instead of ignoring it and putting a movie on or making another popcorn or putting a little more food or walking to the refrigerator again. By the way, I was told this week, Dave, that people need to wear masks in their house. Not because of COVID, but to keep them from eating out of the refrigerator. And and so many of us understand that. Why? Because we're grieving, we're hurting, we're sad. And instead of just owning the sadness, we hide from it. When instead, maybe we should take this verse, Romans 8, 28, and put it on our refrigerator where it says, He works all things for the good of those who love Him. And don't stop there. Those who've been called according to his purpose. It doesn't mean you can just do whatever you want and think there's no consequences. But the truth is, when you say, God, what are you teaching me? What am I supposed to learn? When you take time during this time to confess sin in your life and doubt and fear and all the things that you and I don't trust God about. And by the way, your pastor is the same way you are. I struggle in many ways. Grief can make some people frustrated. Grief makes some people sleepy. People have told me, I don't know why I'm just so tired all the time because you're grieving. I don't know why I'm hungry all the time because you're grieving and you're hurting. I don't know why I've just become a different person right now because you're grieving. And so own that grief and confess it to God. Here's your first confession today. God, I choose to be obedient knowing that you will bring good. In the middle of whatever the hurt You have a choice. You can be snippy to those around you. You can just sleep all the time. You can just eat all the time. You can just hide in a movie all the time. Or you can say, God, what is it that you want me to do? And maybe it's get on the phone and actually call somebody and hear their voice. Maybe it's get your Bible out and and sit outside. We've had some beautiful days that some of us have not even enjoyed because we're so tired. Because we're sad. So let's sit out and know that we're sad and things aren't the same, but embrace that God will work even these things for the good. Number two, God brings peace from fear. Do you remember that show, Let's Make a Deal? I know you don't. It was a long time ago. And I think uh, uh, Brady came back and was doing it not too long ago. But, But it was the idea that you would choose a box and they would give you a choice. They would say, you can take what's in box A or what's box B. And if you chose the wrong box, you'd get what they called a zoink. And, and it was junk. But if you chose the right box, it was awesome. And here's the thing. Too many of us, because we're afraid, we're, we're, just, we're just doing everything we can. We so, we're so busy trying to protect ourselves. Some of us try to protect ourselves. What are we doing right now? We're decontaminating everything. We're, we're afraid. Now, there's nothing wrong with a healthy fear. A healthy fear keeps you from walking to the edge of the Grand Canyon. There's nothing wrong with that. That's healthy. But when it becomes extreme and all you begin to do is try to protect yourself, there's nothing wrong with oven mitts. But if you're wearing them around all day, you may have an issue. There's nothing wrong with hand sanitizer. This is hard to get. This is valuable. There's nothing wrong with hand sanitizer, but if all you do is you're focused so much on the hand sanitizer and not on the people around you, you've chosen the wrong box. See, we get so busy and worried about what could happen or what's next that we don't enjoy the moments we have. Be careful of the fear box. That fear box can take you out. Remember that, that, that bad box and the sad box can bother you, but then the fear box can make you defend yourself all the time and miss life. 
John 20, verse 1 and 2, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark. This is the reason we have sunrise services on Easter. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. By the way, I love this because it's John who writes the story, but he doesn't want to name himself. He even calls himself the one Jesus loved here in a minute. She came running to Simon Peter, the other disciple, you know, the one Jesus loved. It'd be like me saying, I'm Eric, you know, the one Jesus loves. And so he's naming himself without naming himself. And he said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Because she was so afraid, because that fear was so strong, she was in the fear box. She was so busy looking at circumstances and saying, there's no way that she forgot everything that Jesus had said. We struggle with short-term thinking. The disciples did, and we do too. Fear keeps us from doing what God wants us to do and from having joy even in good times. Did you know that even in bad times, you can have joy? Even in the struggles, you can have joy. Even right now, some of you are forced to stay home with your children, and they're driving you crazy, and you've never had to try to teach them math or science or English or physics or whatever they're learning, and you sometimes may even feel dumb. It's okay. Enjoy the moments. Recognize that even when you're in the fear box, you can trust God that he will work it out for the good. A few verses later, it says, Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I've seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And then later it says, on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, see, they were living in the fear box. They couldn't even believe what she said. They kept hiding, even though she said, Jesus is risen. Most of them did not go to the tomb. They just stayed in the room. With the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. And here's what he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Listen, when you're afraid, what you need is peace. No matter where you are, even if you're hiding in the box of fear, he can bring you peace right now. Father, please give me peace when I'm afraid. Father, give me peace. What are you afraid of right now? Is there a situation happening in your life and you're, all you can do is think about the worst thing that can happen? Are you afraid of what's next? Are you afraid of what could happen? You have a friend that's hurting and you're afraid for them. What is your fear? Know that God, the resurrection, reminds us that he brings peace even in fear. So the good from bad, he brings peace from fear. And finally, he brings life from death. He brings life from death. And you know, so often we do things to avoid death, you know, and there's some healthy things that we do. But a lot of us, you know what we do? We get busy. We try to be busy in our work. Maybe we, we obsessively clean. That's not really my problem. Or maybe we go fishing all the time. We have, to, we have these hobbies. And the purpose of our hobbies is to, is, to, is to try to avoid thinking about things that matter sometimes. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with any of the things I've talked about. But when our goal is to run from death by saying busy, maybe it's even in our work. We find all of our satisfaction, everything we do in work. But did you know that all of these things will pass away one day? One day you and I all have to face the fact that one day we will not be here. Whether it's tomorrow, today, or 50 years from now, there will be a day where Eric Brookins will not be here on earth. But we don't have to be afraid. In John 10.10, it says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that they may have life. And then it says more than that, and have it to the full. When you walk around afraid all the time, you cannot enjoy your days. You cannot enjoy the moments. You can't bless other people. Notice when Jesus came into the room, the thing he said to them when he brought them peace was, now go do something. But now you're not just doing things to stay busy. You're doing things because you feel like, I want to make a difference. I want to show people God's 
love. The thief has come to steal people's life. To discourage them. To right now make them feel alone during this time of aloneness. To make them feel scared in the middle of a fearful country. To make them feel angry. How dare somebody do this to me? And Jesus comes and says, I give you my peace. Now take it to other people. In John 14, 6, how can we find that? Jesus gave us the answer to find the way home to him. He didn't say there were many paths to God. He didn't say just be a nice person. He didn't say if you just make your good outweigh your bad. By the way, if you've seen me drive, you know that's probably not happening. But he said, how can I find my way to God? Jesus made it very simple. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you'd know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. See, the way to God is through a person. It's through Jesus Christ. And I would encourage you this week to take some time and read the book of John. Find out who he was. Maybe you have not read the Bible in a long time. Maybe you've been so busy with all these boxes that the Bible is just something extra you do once in a while for insurance. Maybe instead you put these boxes away and take out scripture and say, I want to know Jesus, the one who gives life. And if you're watching today and you want to know what it means to be a Christian, you can call me, you can email me, you can text me, you can send me a message on Facebook and say, Eric, I want to know what it means to be a Christian. I'd be glad to talk to you. I'll talk to you on the phone. I'll text you, whatever's easy for you to show you how to find your way home to Christ. But maybe you're here and you're a Christian. Here's a prayer for you. Father, I'm tired of the enemy who steals, kills, and destroys so many. Help me to allow your life to live in me. Finally, today, I want to give you one final, uh, three final things that you, how you can respond to the death and resurrection of Christ today. Number one, love Christ with all my heart. That's from 1 John 4, 19. Even if God never did anything else for me, he deserves my total devotion. Number two, hate sin, Romans 6, 6. Most people feel like like sin is a a word that it just has to do. Listen, we know what sin is. We know what those wrong desires are. We know what pursuing the wrong thing is. We know what the Bible calls sin. And if we love God, he was nailed to the cross because of our sin. Romans 6, 6. And then number three, tell others. Number three, tell others. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. If someone had a cure for cancer or had a cure for this disease and didn't tell you, wouldn't you be upset about it? Well, you and I have the cure for life. Jesus said it's through him. So today, if you're home and you're a Christian, I want to encourage you, remind yourself of what it means to know him. And if you're not a believer, I want to encourage you, begin to examine the the truths of Christ. Maybe you're a doubter. Maybe you're a skeptic. Hey, Pursue finding out who he is. He says he's a rewarder of those who seek him. Dave's going to come up and do a closing song. You can give online today. We normally have our offering during this time. You can give online. You can even mail a check to the church or have your bank do it. That's what I do. I always forget. And so you can do that today. But the most important thing you can do today is take these boxes and surrender each of them to Christ today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for Easter Sunday where we can meet virtually. Lord, where we and I can come into people's homes and they can interact on Facebook and we can talk to each other. Lord, thank you for this technology that allows us to be together even when we're apart. And Father, I pray that it would not be long till we can be together in person. Lord, that we would appreciate what it really means to gather as a family. We would really appreciate what it means to love people and look them in the eye and be face to face and shake their hand and pat them on the back. Father, I pray that during these times of fear, during these times of doubt, during these times where we're struggling, that you would bring us your peace. And Father, so much peace that it would overflow to other people. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close on.